So I've been asked to talk about the optimal management of cancer-associated thrombosis. And when I first received this title, I thought, I have no idea what optimal management is. Um, as this field is changing over time and we have newer agents, so what I want to do is actually sort of present a, a bit of a case and then work through it and present some of the data and evidence available um, that sort of supports uh, what we are doing for this population. So just to begin with, these are my disclosures. Uh, I do receive research funding from BMS and from the Canadian Institute of Health and Research as well as Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada. I do consultancy for a number of companies, all of whom market um, the anticoagulants, low molecular weight heparins, as well as the direct oral, oral anticoagulants. And finally, I'm involved in a number of guideline committees for ASH, ASCO, and ISTH. And so some of the things, some of my approaches um, that I discussed, you may or may not find sort of biased in one way or the other. I mean, in terms of my objectives this morning, again, I'm going to review the evidence on the efficacy and safety of the available anticoagulants. And I think in the next, next decade or so, we're going to see a lot more agents. So finally, we're going to go from two agents to perhaps 20 agents in a very short period of time. And so that's very exciting. I'm also going to br um, discuss briefly about anticoagulant management in the setting of recurrent thrombosis despite being on anticoagulation and a little bit about what to do when patients develop thrombocytopenia when you do need to give them anticoagulant therapy. And finally, I'm going to ch share my approach in how I make a decision about the duration of anticoagulation as this is definitely an area where we don't really have much evidence at all. So, the case I'm going to sort of talk around about um, is actually a patient that um, I had um, very recently. This was a 63-year-old man who was diagnosed with unprovoked extensive right leg DVT. He was previously well, and uh, so he was started on treatment with rivaroxaban, but unfortunately, while on rivaroxaban, he developed symptomatic PE and was not surprisingly diagnosed with metastatic pancreatic cancer. So at that point, he was switched over to Daltaparin and had clinical improvement, but he had already had significant post-thrombotic syndrome and so was not the happy, happiest of chaps. And uh, he started on chemotherapy for his pancreatic cancer and after three cycles of treatment, he underwent a routine restaging CT scan, which showed he had more PE despite being on low molecular weight heparin and he also had minimal um, tumor response. So we dose escalated his daltaparin because of the evidence of a, a further thrombosis. And after several months, he actually developed progressive jaundice and uh, severe thrombocytopenia, probably as a combination of his chemotherapy, probably marrow involvement from his metastatic cancer. And eventually, he was admitted to hospital for palliation and comfort care. And uh, so if you just keep this case in mind as we talk about the evidence. It will, we will walk through sort of some of, you know, his clinical sort of journey and uh, some of the evidence for um, treatment that we have. So I think many of you know this already, and for those who, who don't know this, about 20%, so one in five cases of all thrombosis cases, occur in the setting of cancer. So this is by no means a rare condition. But unfortunately, there's still a lot we don't know about this condition. What is also very clear now, and still continues to escape oncologists, um, is that this is the second leading cause of death in cancer patients, second only to the progression of cancer. So clearly, if we can um, implement more effective prevention and treatment strategies, we can significantly improve the mortality in this population. This condition also contributes significantly to the morbidity of these uh, patients uh, through their cancer journey. Number one, it often interferes with their cancer treatment. Many oncologists will derail the patient from their first line chemotherapy or other treatments when they develop thrombosis. It also precipitates or prolongs their hospitalization. It certainly increases healthcare resource utilization and it imposes tremendous emotional as well as economic burden on the patients and as well as the system. And again, for those of you who are you know, still looking for a career, you're still a stem cell, have not differentiated yet, this is a growing area. 
right? Because the incidence of cancer thrombosis is only going to increase as we have improved cancer outcomes. There are more patients surviving with advanced disease, and these are the patients who get thrombosis. And we have an increasing aging population, all of whom are going to be susceptible to developing malignancies. So, the cornerstone of treatment for all thrombotic cases, as you know, is anticoagulant therapy. And until very recently, we were pretty much stuck with indirect anticoagulants. They were very effective for the most part, but they're very burdensome. And so on this slide, you see some of the traditional agents that we have, again, indirect anticoagulants, and um, they were certainly burdensome in terms of requiring parenteral therapy, hospitalization, as well as intense monitoring. But more recently, we have potentially the holy grail solution for thrombotic treatment, the direct oral anticoagulants, and they come in two large classes, the direct factor A inhibitors, as well as the direct thrombin inhibitors. And certainly in our setting, in my clinic in, in Vancouver, almost 60 to 70 percent of our patients with acute DVT or PE are treated with these newer agents now. And the only reasons patients don't um, use these new agent, uh, these newer agents, it's often it's the cost associated with the uh, newer drugs compared to the traditional uh, warfarin therapy. These drugs have been tested in very well-designed, rigorous clinical trials, and this slide basically summarizes the largest, largest trials that have ever been done in venous thromboembolism treatment. All of these were randomized control studies which compared um, one of these newer direct oral anticoagulants compared to traditional therapy where patients are treated with infraction heparin or low molecular weight heparin um, initially followed by a vitamin K antagonist warfarin um, or either a newer agent with monotherapy with rivaroxaban or pixaban or an initial brief course of low molecular weight heparin then followed by another um, direct oral anticoagulants. You can see on these slides the Regiments for the direct oral anticoagulants differ slightly depending on the drug, and um, certainly right now there aren't any other variations to how these uh, drugs are being managed. So if you're going to use these drugs, I would highly encourage you to stick to these regiments which have been shown to be effective and safe. These are the Kaplan-Meier curves from the large four studies with the four drugs. And essentially, as all of you know, these drugs were found to be non-inferior to vitamin K antagonists for preventing recurrent thrombosis. And the large meta-analyses that have been done have suggested that these drugs as a whole, as a class, are associated with actually a lower risk of bleeding compared to, tradi tr to traditional therapy with low molecular weight heparin followed by warfarin. So again, there's been certain almost a tsunami, if you will, of switching therapies from low molecular weight heparin warfarin to these direct oral anticoagulants. But what is the evidence for these newer drugs in patients with cancer? And on this slide, I have summarized the evidence for, for cancer patients who are enrolled in these studies. So first of all, you will see that in these studies, only approximately 2 to 9% of the total sample size were patients with cancer. And if you looked at these trials closely, the definition of patients with cancer or active cancer were different in every single study. So you really cannot be combining the results from these various studies to say that, yes, these agents work or don't work in patients with cancer. And in fact, in the Adoxaban trial, they included patients with a history of cancer where they were already cured of their previous cancer, but they were still categorized as cancer patients. And as many of you who work in this area, cancer patients who have thrombosis or active cancer patients with thrombosis certainly don't act anything like the non-cancer patient and they certainly don't behave the same way in terms of response to therapy. But if you look at the available data, it certainly suggests that perhaps the direct oral anticoagulants have comparable effectiveness and safety compared to the direct oral anticoagulants. Um, but if you look at the response rate and the bleeding rates for even the control group, the groups that received um, warfarin therapy, 
these numbers, recurrent thrombosis, is much lower than what we had observed in prior studies when we were looking at low molecular weight heparin. And so it suggests that these cancer patients were certainly not the typical cancer patients, but they were highly selected. And in fact, in several of the studies, patients who were deemed to require low molecular weight heparin were excluded from these trials. So again, even if you believe this data and you take it as it is, you have to remember there were cancer patients who were selected out of these clinical trials, so we should not be applying these results uniformly to all cancer patients with thrombotic diseases. More recently, there's been more data from sort of post hoc subgroup analysis from the large trials looking at the cancer patients. And I pulled this one um, up for you because I want to illustrate something in particular that we were not we were aware of, but was never really well documented. And in, in this um, post hoc analysis of the data from the Einstein DVT in PE trials, they enrolled 462 patients who had active cancer at the time of randomization at baseline. And active cancer defined in this trial was not clear, in fact, at the time of enrollment. So the definition was left up to the investigator. So this is probably a heterogeneous group of patients, all right? And in this trial, again, they excluded patients who were deemed to require low molecular weight heparin for treatment of the cancer-associated thrombosis. But they followed these patients, and then in retrospect, they recategorized all of these patients who had cancer at enrollment, and as well as then counted patients who developed cancer during the study as patients who have cancer. So clearly, it's nice to know in retrospect that when you had a patient who had unprovoked thrombosis, like my patient had, um, who then ultimately were found to have cancer, but you can't really do this in a clinical trial setting. But in this group, they basically looked at the retrospective data. And what they showed, interestingly, was that in the patients who developed cancer during the study, all right, their risk of recurrent thrombosis was much higher than the other groups who didn't have cancer, patients who had a history of cancer but no longer had ha cancer at the time of enrollment, patients who did have cancer even at a baseline. So you can see this is a particularly thrombogenic group and uh, so certainly consistent with the patient that I was involved with who had unprovoked thrombosis and then later diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And I think this actually nicely illustrates that um, the cancers that initially present as thrombosis, so these are patients with occult cancers, they have a particularly thrombogenic phenotype. And I think we really need to study this group in particular to help us understand the underlying mechanisms and perhaps come up with better therapies. In all of this sort of subgroup analyses and post hoc analyses, you can see there's really no difference between rivaroxaban and vitamin K antagonists between, um, certainly for these um, patients with cancer. But again, even if you look at the patients with cancer at baseline, their outcomes for those who received um, vitamin K antagonists was really no different from the patients without cancer. So again, suggesting a huge selection bias for the patients who were enrolled in these studies. So what are the limitations of these direct oral anticoagulant kits in cancer patients right now? Well, right now we still have very sparse details on what are these cancer patients and what are their prognostic factors in terms of recurrent thrombosis, bleeding, as well as death. Clearly, these were healthier cancer patients who were enrolled compared to the low molecular weight heparin studies. And right now, we still don't have published data um, for comparison of the direct oral anticoagulants against low molecular weight heparin. But there has been a large a global clinical trial that has just completed um, enrollment. So we will have some data out in the next year or so. And finally, even though as much as we hate to give parental therapy or injections and patients hate to receive injections, injections bypasses a common problem in cancer patients when they have GI toxicity and mucosal uh, absorption problems, where in that an injection gives you a reliable method of delivery. Whereas in patients who are taking oral therapy, if they took a tablet, vomited a few hours later, you have no idea what that impact is and how much of the anticoagulant activity is available. 
Also, there's a bit of a concern that in all of these trials, certainly with the bigger trend and rivaroxaban, there is a higher risk of GI bleeding in these patients compared to those who received uh, warfarin therapy. And GI bleeds is the number one source of bleeding in cancer patients. So we have to keep that in mind. We also don't have therapeutic ranges established for these agents, although this was really sold as being a, an important benefit in that we don't have to monitor or measure or dose adjust. It now becomes a little bit of an Achilles heel when these patients do receive drugs that have drug interactions, especially with chemotherapy, some antibiotics, then what is the impact on these patients, especially if they're on multi-agent regimens where they may have one agent that's an inducer, another agent that's an inhibitor, and overall, what is the net impact of the plasma, uh, on the plasma levels of these drugs? We still don't know. And uh, on this slide, um, I have listed some of the more sort of common drugs, if you will, or the classes of drugs that do increase the plasma levels of the direct oral anticoagulants or reduce the levels. And some of the important ones include tamoxifen, all the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, um, dexamethasone, commonly given to many cancer patients for suppression of nausea and also for stimu um, appetite stimulant, as well as doxorubicin. So you do have to keep it in mind, and often I have to go through the entire list of drugs that these patients are on to try to determine if there are any significant drug interactions. So even though much, much better than warfarin, there are still drug interactions that you need to be mindful of. And unlike warfarin, where we do have an INR so we can measure the interaction, we right now do not have that available for direct oral anticoagulants. And so clearly, I think the guideline recommendations to use low molecular weight heparin still remains the best recommendation for treatment of patients with cancer-associated thrombosis. Clearly, low molecular weight heparin has superior um, efficacy over vitamin <coughs> K antagonists without increasing bleeding. There is no interaction with cancer treatments. It is actually much more flexible in terms of accommodating invasive procedures. The dosing, you can dial up or down at will. We have assays available if you decide and monitoring is required. And it does give us a reliable means of delivering the drug. We know once the injection goes in, the drug is in there. And we don't have to worry about the patient if they're vomiting, if their diet is quite variable. These recommendations, all right, are based on large studies. Many of you are familiar with this already, that, but were done many um, years ago. The most uh, recent one was the CATCH study. And all of these looked at monotherapy with a low molecular weight heparin compared to traditional therapy. But once again, you can see that the regimens um, differ slightly. With the daltaparin regimen, there was a dose reduction at one month, whereas with enoxaparin and tinzaparin, the full dose of low molecular weight heparin um, were given uh, throughout the um, treatment period. And uh, these are Kaplan-Meier curves from the two large studies. You can see that the low molecular weight heparin was associated with a lower risk of recurrent thrombosis. And um, in these two large trials, um, the, there's been a significant shift, actually, in the patient population as well, where in the CLOT trial, um, about 60 to 70 percent of the patients had metastatic disease, and by the time we did CATCH trial more recently, only about 40 percent of the patients have metastatic disease. And if you look at the direct oral anticoagulant trials, only 20 percent of the patients have metastatic disease. So clearly, I want to illustrate this as a point that we almost never talk about in methodology is that there is significant bias that goes on ahead of enrolling your patients in clinical trials in terms of the large patient selection, who gets to go into studies, who, who don't get to go into it. So again, when you're reading the results from trials, you have to keep that in mind. And even though it does not, it, it will not ever come up in your publication. And despite low molecular weight heparin, you can see from the previous graphs, there's still a significant number of patients who develop recurrent thrombosis. And this often occurs in the setting of progressive malignancy. And for many years now, I've been trying to decide 
or figure out what are the possible mechanisms. Why are these patients still developing recurrent thrombosis de despite low molecular weight heparin or more effective therapies? And certainly the number one that comes across is non-compliance. Are these patients simply not injecting? But if you actually look at um, studies that have looked at compliance, patients are extraordinarily compliant with injection therapy. And when you ask them why, they have a strong belief this is very effective therapy, I must give this once a day, an injection is somehow more powerful and more important than a pill, so they stick with it. And it, it's actually quite impressive. Many of these patients, though, do have interruption of therapy because they undergo invasive procedures, they may be hospitalized, they may get thrombocytopenia, so sometimes that may be responsible for recurrence. A small number of patients do develop heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. In both the CLOT and the CATCH studies, all right, where there's almost 1,000 patients who received low molecular weight heparin, there was not a single case of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia that was, was, that was reported or confirmed. So you can see that there, the incidence of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is actually quite low in this population. The other mechanisms, which I think is probably most responsible for recurrences, are that in patients with cancer-associated thrombosis, there's greater non-specific binding of the low molecular weight heparin. So the available amount of low molecular weight heparin um, probably is reduced in the cancer setting. And perhaps there is, there's been some evidence that there's accelerated clearance of low molecular weight heparin. So in fact, once daily dosing may not uh, be sufficient in these patients. And we know that in these patients, they can uh, generate massive amounts of thrombin. And so clearly in some of these patients, dose is the major uh, problem in that they required higher doses, and when they do have massive um, thrombotic um, conditions, they develop an acquired anti-thrombin deficiency, and clearly this would limit the efficacy of low molecular weight heparin, which requires anti-thrombin to be effective. So if we keep this in mind, how do we treat patients with recurrent thrombosis? So there's limited observational data that suggests that empiric dose escalation of low molecular weight heparin is in fact effective and safe. And this would go along with the mechanism in that these patients may have greater nonspecific binding as well as greater thrombin generation. So we just require a higher dose of low molecular weight heparin to uh, overcome it. And in these observational studies, it was shown that if you increase the dose of low molecular weight heparin by 25% or higher, it was effective in more than 80% of these patients. These are small studies and retrospective, but certainly gives you confidence in increasing the dose of low molecular weight heparin. And that's my sort of standard go-to um, approach when I do have a patient who break, breaks through. And the highest dose I've ever gone to now is twice the recommended dose of low molecular weight heparin, and the patient did not experience any bleeding. And a good way to actually gauge whether the patient has reached a therapeutic dosing of low molecular weight heparin is the amount of bruising they start to get when they do their sub-Q injections. It's amazingly reliable, much better than 10A levels. Anyways, I digress. But there are potentially other therapeutic options that have been talked about or discussed. And so one, change to BID dosing, and it seems to be effective in some patients. And I will do this, especially in the patients who require larger doses. So their single syringe size is no longer able to support. So for example, if they require more than 20,000 units once a day, you don't have pre-filled syringes available, so I break it down to twice daily dosing. There's literature that's supported or suggests that we use other anticoagulants, perhaps switching to another low molecular weight heparin, switching the patients to unfractured heparin, using fondaparinox, warfarin, and of course, direct oral anticoagulants. And lastly, it's always, always been written that we should consider inserting an IVC filter in these patients. But what I want to do is now show you the evidence available for using these other agents as alternatives when patients break through low molecular weight heparin. For many of you in the audience, you're way too young to remember the use of warfarin in can patients with cancer-associated thrombosis. But when I was a fellow and we were still using warfarin therapy, it was a headache. If they ever did a quality of life study in physicians in managing warfarin in cancer patients, 
it would show what a disaster it was. It was a disaster for physicians, it was a disaster for patients, mainly because of the large fluctuations in INRs. And also, despite your best efforts, these patients continue to develop recurrent thrombosis and also have a much higher risk of bleeding compared to patients without cancer. And it was shown that even if you were able to maintain the INR in a therapeutic range, these patients had a much higher risk of recurrent thrombosis and major bleeding compared to patients with can uh, without cancer. So clearly, warfarin is not a good option. Well, what about fondaparinox? In a way, if you think about it, fondaparinox is just parenteral rivaroxaban or parenteral pixaban. It is a 10A inhibitor. It is indirect, but nonetheless, it is still the major mechanism is 10A inhibition. The only data available to look at whether 10A inhibition alone is effective in cancer-associated thrombosis actually goes back to 2009 when um, the Dutch group looked at a post-hoc sort of um, analysis of the Matisse data. The Matisse um, studies were a pair of studies that looked at the effectiveness and safety of fondaparinox against low molecular weight heparin when fondaparinox was first introduced. And when they looked at the subgroup of cancer patients, you can see there was a strong suggestion that fondaparinox was associated with a much higher risk of recurrent thrombosis compared to enox heparin. Now, this was a post-hoc analysis, so clearly the patients may not have been balanced in terms of the prognostic factors. It's also very hard to know what type of cancer patients these were. Perhaps this was just due to inadequate dosing for fondaparinox, or there is insufficient suppression of the contact pathway or thrombin activity. And again, increasingly, we're aware that contact pathway activation is very important and that 10A inhibition alone is not enough to suppress contact pathway uh, contribution to activation of coagulation. So a little bit of perhaps a, a break on perhaps monotherapy with 10A inhibition would be enough in cancer patients. And finally, the IVC filter um, problem. To me, I always basically tell people, avoid the IVC filter like you want to avoid the plague especially in cancer patients, because this device, even though it's been used for over 40 years, has never been adequately addressed in terms of its efficacy and safety. We often use it in patients who fail anticoagulant therapy or in patients who cannot receive anticoagulant therapy, but the trials that have actually been done to look at, uh, low uh, look at um, filter use have su suggested these mechanical devices do not suppress the burden of th uh, thrombosis. In fact, they increase the risk of recurrent DVT. And population-based data now in cancer patients have shown that there's absolutely no benefit in mortality or risk of subsequent PE in these patients, but it actually contributes to a higher risk of DVT. And there's now been a lot of cumulative data to show that long-term complications are very common in patients with IVC filters in terms of recurrent thrombosis, the filter tilting, fracturing, migrating, embolizing as well as IVC perforation, which actually occurs in over 80% of patients who have IVC filters in place. And finally, many of these patients develop post-thrombotic syndrome, and that's a tremendous uh, impairment on their quality of life. So what I usually tell all my colleagues and students and so on is you do not, do not, do not insert an IVC filter for recurrent thrombosis because it does not address the underlying mechanisms. Clots do not know not to clot above a filter, right? There's no reason why thrombosis does not occur proximal to a filter. So there is no reason why we should be inserting filters into patients when they develop recurrent thrombosis. They're already telling you these are pro-thrombotic pro cases. So this is still sort of my approach to recurrent thrombosis, and I published it in the ASH Education uh, book a number of years ago, and it really just follows the, um, the sort of thinking that most of these patients are breaking through low molecular weight heparin because there's still 
um, massive amounts of thrombin generation. So patients who develop symptomatic or recurrent thrombosis, if they fail on their low molecular weight heparin, I empirically increase the dose and I reassess the patients in about a week. If they have symptomatic improvement, I have done my job, I continue with the same dose and I continue with the same follow-up. However, if the patient has no improvement, that's when I check their anti-10A level to see how high of the next escal uh, dose escalation I would go out with, as opposed to sort of gingerly going up by small steps. And I have found this to be quite effective and have not seen um, um, increases in bleeding in my patients. So this is consistent also with the ISTH um, scientific subcommittee um, recommendations in that in patients who have recurrent thrombosis, for those who were on vitamin K antagonists, switch them to low molecular weight heparin. You dose escalate by about 25% or resume the therapeutic dosing if they already had stepped down earlier. You want to continue with the same dose empirically, um, sorry, uh, same dose if the patients improve and you consider doing 10A levels if there is uh, no symptom improvement to help you increase the dose. In many of these patients though, they do develop thrombocytopenia as well because of massive platelet <laughs> consumption from increasing thrombosis. And also many of these patients do develop um, thrombocytopenia as a result of their cancer or their chemotherapy. And there's been a lot of questions asked about what to, how to manage these patients. And as you, all of you know, there are no randomized control studies looking at this question. And there's probably gonna also always gonna be a paucity of high quality evidence to tell us what's the optimal management in this setting. But again, these are the ISTH recommendations or guidance um, statements in that if the patient's platelet count is above 50, full dose low molecular weight heparin is recommended. And this has been consistent practice and recommendations but by other guidelines as well. However, if the thrombotic event, all right, has been diagnosed within the first month where the risk of recurrence is very, very high, we recommend giving platelet transfusions to support full dose low molecular weight heparin. So again, if your platelet count goes above 50 after platelet transfusion, you would give full dose. However, if the platelet count is less than 50, you may consider filter insertion. So this is certainly not something that I like to do, but it is um, certainly considered and uh, done by other um, experts. If the thrombotic event, though, is already chronic, and that is more than a month old, then platelet transfusion is not required or recommended. And uh, if the platelet counts between 20 to 50, we reduce the dose of low molecular heparin to about 50% or prophylactic dose. And if it's less than 25%, we withhold the, the low molecular heparin until the platelet count recovers. Again, there's really no solid evidence to support this um, management, um, but there has been a recent uh, paper that actually does support that these general rec recommendations are, um, are sound and reasonable to follow. This is a um, fairly sizable retrospective cohort study that looked at patients who develop cancer-associated thrombosis and at the same time had thrombocytopenia with a platelet count of less than 100. And they looked at basically how the patients were managed in terms of their anticoagulant therapy when they had both thrombocytopenia and acute thrombosis. And what they found what they, was that there was an extraordinarily high risk of recurrent thrombosis, 45% in those who did not receive full dose low molecular weight heparin. And that the patients who actually did receive low molecular weight heparin, they still had a low incidence of major bleeding. So it is very clear from this study that thrombocytopenia does not confer protection from recurrent thrombosis. So you should not sit easy and say, well, the patient doesn't require anticoagulant therapy because they have a low platelet count that may protect them. That is in fact not true. And when they look at this group and um, sorted them out in terms of the group, the patients who did not receive any anticoagulant therapy, patients who received partial therapy, so either reduced dose or abbreviated a duration of anticoagulation versus those who received sort of the full dose complete therapy, the risk of recurrence is quite different. You can see that the patients who received full dose had a much lower risk of recurrent thrombosis 
these patients are obviously also had a slightly higher platelet count as well. These patients did not have a significantly high risk of bleeding, but the patients who did not receive anti any anticoagulant therapy, the risk of recurrent <coughs> thrombosis, all these were symptomatic events, was actually 47%. Patients who received partial therapy, recurrence was still 44%, and all of these patients also had a substantial risk of, um, thromb uh, of bleeding as well. And so again, this uh, group, patients with thrombosis as well as perhaps severe um, thrombocytopenia will remain a very, very important group um, and certainly therapeutic challenge for us going forward. For those who are lucky enough to survive their initial three to six months of anticoagulant therapy with their cancer-associated thrombosis, and this is only about 60% of patients. So in those patients who develop thrombosis and have active cancer, only about 60% are alive at six months. And for these 60%, we now have to make a decision about how long to continue their anticoagulant therapy. And again, there's absolutely no clinical trial evidence on how we should manage these patients. And right now, we actually have very little data on what's the natural history of these patients. If you scowl through the literature, there's very little reported on what happens to these patients. What's their mortality? What's their risk of recurrence? What's their risk of bleeding? And but. Many, many guidelines have recommended that we should continue therapy as long as the cancer is active or if the patient's receiving chemotherapy, but we should discontinue if the risk of serious bleeding outweighs the risk of recurrence. Although this is sound advice, still not based on a lot of data. And, and really the only data available right now is actually from Adultican study, and this was a single um, prospective cohort study where they looked at 334 patients, treated them with a the clot regimen, but treated them up to a year, so beyond that six-month period. And the data shows you that beyond the six-month period, patients continue to have a high risk of recurrence in terms of 0.7% per month, so that's still approximately all right, 8 to 10% a year, so it's still high, and this is on low molecular weight heparin therapy. These patients also continue to have um, a, a significant risk of bleeding as well, unfortunately, at about 0.7 per month. So approximately beyond the six month period, the risk of bleeding versus the risk of clotting on anticoagulant therapy is about the same. Does this help us in determining what we should do Probably not, uh, but it, it is more evidence that uh, these patients do have a high risk of recurrence and bleeding after that six month period, but the risk of major bleeding is really over after the first month. And um, despite continuing anticoagulant therapy, the risk of um, recurrence is substantial. So it does support that in patients with active cancer or uh, receiving um, chemotherapy, we should continue anticoagulant therapy. So this is my approach basically right now. I assess the patients at three months intervals and I will continue anticoagulant therapy if they have aggressive, progressive, or metastatic cancer because in our experience, and certainly based on the Daltican study, these patients continue to have a high risk of recurrence. I also continue anticoagulant therapy if they're on systemic chemotherapy or very thrombogenic therapy. So specifically, patients with multiple myeloma who are still on lenalidomide with dexamethasone. Um, also, if the patient has a previous history of thrombosis before their cancer diagnosis, because we know these already are clotters, so they're gonna have a higher risk of recurrence. If they have residual symptoms from an extensive DVT or PE, I also continue anticoagulant therapy because none of these patients are interested in having a recurrent thrombotic event because of the severe impairment in their quality of life. And also it's very important to um, pro make sure that your anticoagulant therapy is consistent with your overall goals of care. So if the patient is receiving cancer treatment to suppress the disease, then we need to give supportive care to prevent complications. And um, once you've made a decision that you want to continue anticoagulant therapy, that's when I looked at what are the anticoagulant options that they want to go with. And right now, we don't really have any comparative evidence between different agents before uh, beyond the six months. So this is a discussion between you and your patients about the options available, and I've already given you data on the op 
the options and what are their, uh, what's the evidence uh, beyond the six months. But it's really, really important to maximize the patient's preference, their quality of life, as well as autonomy. And so I'm just going to close with um, a, a few slides about patient values and preference. And I want to do this because uh, much of this data actually comes from the UK. And um, there's been substantial quality um, research actually that have shown that, in fact, cancer patients do accept daily injections. And um, they, injections give them a sense of empowerment, security, and convenience. Um, this is certainly surprising to many of us when we um, sort of looked at the results of these studies. And in a very recent study where the patients were actually asked to rank what characteristics of a drug therapy is most important to you um, for treating their thrombosis, they felt that a drug that does not interfere with their ongoing cancer treatment was that was the most important quality. Next thing was data on efficacy, then safety, and it's only then that they said they would look at the different routes of delivery. So if you don't have an agent, if you have an agent that interferes with their cancer treatment, they're just not going to go there, and they would prefer to inject. So going back to my patient, um, as you know, he went through quite a uh, tremulous course and illustrates that in patients who do have cancer-associated thrombosis, they do break through the direct oral anticoagulants. They also can break through weight-adjusted standard doses of low molecular weight heparin. And unfortunately, many of them will come to their end of journey, uh, and that's often complicated by thrombocytopenia or even bleeding, which continues to be very difficult to manage. And finally, when they come for palliation and comfort of care, it is very important to readdress what goals you're trying to address. And um, for my patient here, actually, he decided to go to hospice but continue with his low molecular weight heparin injections. And his reasoning was that he did not want to give up. He still wanted to feel that he was contributing to managing his disease. He also did not want to suffer more pain in his legs because he had severe post-thrombotic syndrome from when um, uh, he failed on rivaroxaban, and so he did not, um, he, and he was already comfortable with injections. So this patient of mine actually went to hospice continuing on low molecular weight heparin therapy, and he continued it until the date of death. So I hope I've convinced you, if you didn't know already, that cancer-associated thrombosis is a common, complex, and a costly complication. It remains a huge therapeutic challenge. So again, for those of you who don't have an area you want to specialize in, <coughs> sky's the limit. Almost every single question you want to answer has not been addressed properly yet. The best evidence right now is still for low molecular weight heparin in these patients, but that may change as we are looking more at the use of direct oral anticoagulants. And they're certainly going to be, I think, a useful alternative for some of our patients. And finally, it is always, always very important to tailor the therapeutic choices to be consistent with the overall goals of care for your patients. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>